Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, we are going to talk about uh, rounding out our system-wide advocacy team. Uh, you'll go through what we started with and why we started that way, all the way up until now and our plans um, for the future. So I'm going to start off with all the history stuff because I'm old and I've been here a while. Um, Tiffany, can, uh, can you move to the next slide, please? All right. So first of all, I need to make sure that we define what it is we are here at Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, we are the textbook affordability initiative for the university system of Georgia. That includes all the state colleges and universities. That does not include the technical colleges and the community colleges. Um, that's a different system called the TCSG. Uh, we have program funding that supports all of this. Uh, it's focused on one thing, and that is reducing costs for students for required materials, but it is focused on that in order to contribute to student success. Um, often the metrics that are brought up in our state are retention, progression, and graduation. Um, our vision and mission here uh, is kind of under construction when it comes to wordsmithing. We're working with our champions on it, uh, but really it's focused on educational equity. And some of our big principles at ALG, one is that we're not a mandate, we are focused on academic freedom. There are um, systems and institutions out there that completely act as departments or they have an administration that tells them something and then they do it. If we did that here in our system, uh, I think ALG would be dissolved very quickly. Uh, we need to really make sure that our faculty who are hired as subject matter experts uh, can teach the way that they want to teach and teach with what they want to teach with. So as we move on through this and we talk about raising awareness and we talk about support, it all comes back to the idea that we're here to help. We are not here to tell people what to do. Um, we tend to be very patient and persistent. Um, we want to raise awareness as much as possible. And we have to be aware that there are new people coming in all the time who do not know about OER. And those who do know about OER could always learn something new. Um, so we have training and outreach programs that range from the really beginner stuff all the way to the advanced. Uh, we are definitely open to all. We are trying as hard as possible to focus on accessible content. Uh, inclusion is uh, a newer focus for us. Uh, we really wanted to have that be uh, an institutional push before, but I think now we could take a more proactive approach. Um, and we want to make sure that we uh, that everyone in our institutions know that we have a wide perspective on this, that one thing is not going to be the solution for educational equity. Um, and it's not only going to be the solution for reducing the costs. Okay, next slide, please. So when you don't have a mandate, when you're not telling people what to do, you need to really get buy-in. And I'm sure plenty of you know this. Um, we have uh, many initiatives going on throughout the university system, uh, including uh, some that are one year long, some that last for five or six years. So uh, administrators and faculty are constantly looking at the many initiatives going on and wondering which ones they are going to interact with at the time. So we need to constantly be aware of that. There are also structural silos. Library initiatives can be amazing and also stuck in the library. Um, same with instructional designers and uh, the Centers for Teaching and Learning. We know that time is an issue. We're all being overworked, especially right now. Um, and so we need to support the extra time that it takes to adopt, adapt, and create OER. And uh, the rigidity trap that was mentioned earlier in uh, Liberating Structures, I believe uh, Mahabali mentioned it, we have to make sure that we're constantly aware of that and we want to bring in different perspectives as much as we can. Um, so next slide, please. So with all of that said, before I get to what we did, um, I want to make sure that you all know that how much instructional design has been built into ALG. All the way back in 1999, uh, the USG decided to create an online way to do your core curriculum courses. And part of that was a uh, faculty development specialist, Marie Lassiter, in the USG offices. She thought these things are being created by the state, by state funds. We need to make sure that they are shared. 
So she started a repository. It was decommissioned in 2011, but she used the remaining funds to make the first USG open textbook. BJ Robinson is here in the chat and an ALG champion. She is the director of the UNG Press that worked with her on that first open textbook. Uh, OpenStax going big in 2012 was a big deal too. So we formed a pilot team in 2013 and said, what are we going to do next? Uh, next slide, please. So we had to go with what we knew um, from the start. We knew who our stakeholders were and we knew that we could contact uh, every provost or VPAA um, through the chancellor's office. We knew that we could make this a, a pretty big deal if we went through the right channels. So we asked them, and this took a lot, of, uh, a lot of time, a lot of following up, to select a faculty campus champion on their campus. Someone who maybe didn't know about OER because it was 2014, not everybody knew. Uh, but at least somebody who was very much into innovation and teaching and learning, someone who is uh, attending teaching and learning conferences, they're into SOTL. Um, we also, of course, have direct access to all of our deans of libraries. Um, that's through the uh, Regents Academic Committee. Galileo is the uh, big library organization that we're a part of. We interact with them all the time. So they selected a library coordinator. So now the libraries and the academic affairs people knew that this was happening. Uh, so our original plan uh, was that the campus champion, the faculty person would raise awareness of the faculty. The library coordinator um, would be the person who you'd have as like a point person for licensing. They know copyright, they know repositories, they know even libguides, and that could be a really good way to make stuff open. So it seems like this was a pretty cool plan. But in practice, it was a little different. A lot of campus champions, um, because they weren't able to find a faculty member who was heavily involved in this stuff, who could do this ALG work, they went to the library for it. So we wound up with two librarians. Um, nobody else really knew about OER or Creative Commons, so they often thought, well, this is the best person for the job. And also in practice, we thought that these roles would be doing two different things. But most of the time you had a team who are largely doing the same kind of work, but bringing different ideas in. I have a question from Tiffany McClennan that says, are the chancellors the equivalent of the president? Our chancellor is, there's just one chancellor in the system office and then the presidents are over each institution. So that's what we're talking about here. Chancellor is the head of the system office. Okay, next slide, please. So, our champions and coordinators were a huge part of ALG from the beginning. And if you've ever heard me talk about Affordable Learning Georgia, I usually say we would be absolutely nowhere without our champions and coordinators. For one thing, we can't talk with everybody in the USG all at once. There's no listserv that would allow us to send a bunch of emails to all of the faculty here, uh, not at all. Um, the champions and coordinators were doing the work of sending compelling emails to their faculty, their librarians, getting everybody interested. They were the outreach people by default. Um, they ran workshops, they invited guest speakers. Georgia Highlands College ran an entire OER summit because their vice president came to our symposium and really said, this is gonna be part of our strategy. Um, and then we went and spoke at that summit. Uh, they meet with us monthly. They've been meeting with us monthly since 2014. Uh, some of them have been there the whole time. Um, and because of that, they're often the source of new information outside of an opt-in newsletter for what's happening in ALG. <laughs> Kathy, yeah, okay. Compelling emails are not easy to do. Uh, that's, why they're, that's why they're awesome. Uh, and because there wasn't anyone else at the institution that knew about these textbook transformation grants. They often played the role of grant application consultants. I didn't even know about this, but then I talked to someone who would have one-on-one -on -one meetings. Okay, next slide. So we thought that the difference between champions and coordinators was uh, a thing that happened and we were completely wrong. We didn't have clearly defined roles. The USG was merging institutions together. So what even is a campus was a problem. And a lot of institutions didn't find a champion outside of the library. So let's go to the next slide. 
and we had no time to fix them because for a while there, I was a one-person show. Uh, we had the person above me retire in 2016. In 2017, we brought Marie Laster on, and she's awesome, but she ran an entire conference by herself, which for some of you uh, today, you know exactly how that is because you're running open ed. Um, in 2019, she retired too, but all was not lost, and this is where I'm going to move it over to Tiffany. So, well, actually, let me let me talk about the, the hiring process here. We wanted an instructional designer. Uh, Marie had a lot of expertise and knowledge of what faculty wanted and also about um, accessibility uh, when it came to OER. And we didn't know that. We were librarians. We knew all about metadata and hosting and all that stuff, but we needed course design knowledge. Tiffany knew all this, and she was a nine-time textbook transformation grantee uh, for, through ALG at Kennesaw State. So the search committee hired her in late 2019. She started in February 2020, and there is my timer. Um, so I started the onboarding process. I thought we were all good to go. Um, and then, now I'll turn to Tiffany. So yeah, so I, I started and we started having conversations, started talking about, um, I guess, where things stood, where, th where things could change. And suddenly we had all these ideas. So we, you know, we said, hey, we should add instructional designers because we know that instructional designers have been valuable on grant teams. So we should really add them to our uh, champions team. And then we were like, well, does champions and coordinators really work for that anymore? Because they're kind of all like, they're kind of all both champions and coordinators. I, and, and so we ended up sort of changing that name and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we also said, you know, we should do some professional development for our champions and coordinators. And, uh, and then we talked about maybe doing an in-person leadership retreat for them. Um, but of course, um, I was not the only one over here saying hey all the time because then COVID came in um, and said, oh, hey, there you are. What an inconvenient time for a pandemic. Um, honestly, I think that there's never going to be a convenient time for a pandemic and it's always going to be hard, but it definitely came at an inconvenient time for us after we had talked about all these ideas. And so with that, we were like, okay, we can still do the instructional designers. Um, and so we reviewed the team and we reviewed our grants program and we saw a few things. Um, we saw that collaborations with librarians produced better projects as far as the uh, copyright and um, uh, you know, use of library resources, libguides, things like that. Um, we also saw that instructional designer collaborations produced better projects um, because uh, they, they usually resulted in better student success rates um, and uh, positive student feedback. Um, we also saw that uh, our team was heavily weighted towards libraries at the time, and um, Jeff mentioned that too, but, um, you know, we, we initially wanted an instructional campus champion, and like, a faculty, like an instructional faculty campus champion, and a library coordinator from each institution, um, but we did kind of end up with um, a lot of the faculty positions being filled by librarians as well. Um, and so some institutions, um, it all lived in the library. And then we also saw that it was time to start looking more at the, the next step in open, and that's open pedagogy, OER enabled pedagogy. And so with that, um, we decided that we needed to make some changes to the team. Um, and so we started with a proposal to our current, our, our then current team. Um, we said, you know, here's what we want to do. We want to change the name of the team to ALG champions. We want you all to be champions because that's what you all are. You guys are like our feet on the ground on the campuses. Um, you make such a huge difference. And so we, converted some things though. We converted our campus champion to a faculty champion, um, but we specified that we wanted instructional faculty. 
We converted our library coordinator position to a library champion, which stayed relatively the same, um, but we sort of uh, adjusted the descriptions to be in line with the, uh, the uh, with, in collaboration with the faculty champion and um, sort of creating this team. And then we created this new position, the design champion. And this was where we were gonna bring in instructional designers. The idea was that we would, um, we would ask for an instructional designer or a CETL representative or someone with instructional design expertise who either knows about or wants to know about open pedagogy, OER enabled pedagogy, OER, all that good stuff. Um, recognizing that a lot of the campuses didn't necessarily have that already, which is why we sort of put the, that emphasis on we also like if you want to know about this stuff, if you're open to training, we're open, you know, we, we want we want you to join us. Um, and so and then we also decided that we needed to uh, create a training for all these new positions. Um, and so the process took a little while. Um, it took a few months. So for several months our, at our meetings, we were introducing new people. Um, we were updating on the progress um, of this, this, these changes. And so we ended up with uh, the name and the position titles changed immediately. So we converted direct positions. Um, we started filling the positions. And so we worked over a few months. We worked with the provosts and the VPAAs, um, uh, Vice Presidents for Academic Affairs. Um, we worked with our current champions um, and then we, in some cases, we worked with the CETL offices, um, Centers for Excellence in Teaching and Learning um, for the design positions and sometimes the faculty positions as well. We also shifted a lot of positions. And so with that sort of heavily being weighted on the side of libraries, we, st we started looking at um, ways to even out the teams a little bit and spread them out amongst the three uh, views that we were looking for. Um, so we talked with the teams and we talked with them about what was best for their institutions. And, uh, in, and then also with that, we also had to talk with them about what they needed because a lot of the institutions had merged. And so some institutions in Georgia have like a lot of campuses and maybe they don't all communicate. I'm thinking Georgia State off the top of my head. <laughs> Um, and so we sort of talked with them about, you know, do you need only one, you know, one in each position or, you know, do you need one for your main campus and one for your satellite campuses? Um, so we talked about some shifting. Um, and then when we were finished, um, Jeff, if you don't mind putting that link in the chat, um, we had a, we, we now have a complete team with the exception of one single position in the entire system, um, which is pretty good because we had been sitting on a lot of empty positions before this. Um, and so it was, uh, it was pretty, it was a, an intensive process. It took us a long time, but we got it, we got it all done and it, uh, it, it turned out really good. We've got some descriptions on that website as well, um, if you're interested in how we describe each of those positions. Um, but in the meantime, while we were doing all of that, we also recognized that, okay, now we have COVID, so we probably can't really do an in-person leadership retreat. Um, so we had to kind of push that off to the side um, to think about at, at another time when it's safe to meet in person again. Um, but we still needed that training. And that was one of the things that the previous team had wanted um, at this retreat was to do some training, some accessibility training, some pedagogy training, things like that. And so we said, okay, let's create an asynchronous online training. Um, this is designed to be an onboarding training, but we, uh, but we dispersed it to the current team and a lot of them also completed it and, and sort of brought some new things out of it. Um, and so the topics we covered were uh, an introduction to ALG. So we had to, so some of the people coming in may have been new to everything that ALG does. So we needed to introduce them to who we are and what we do. 
and what are they supporting? What's their role in this? Um, we also introduced them to our, our main program, the Affordable Materials Grants, previously called Textbook Transformation Grants. Um, that also went through a major overhaul that is not in the scope of this presentation, but um, I, you're, I encourage you to go look at that on our website too. Um, so we had to tell them all about our grants program because that's what the faculty are gonna be asking them about. Um, we did a brief introduction to open educational resources in case there are people who are completely new to it. We did um, an introduction to accessibility and what we've been doing at ALG to meet accessibility, uh, meet, meet that challenge. We also did a brief introduction to open and OER enabled pedagogy to start getting, getting them thinking about that stuff in addition to some resources on where to go to learn more. Um, and then we ended it with a completion quiz that spit out a custom certificate for them if they got 80% or higher on it. Um, and so they even got this certificate out of it to, to show. Um, and we, we did this all in Google Sites. Um, that should be Sites, oh no, in one handy Google Site, never mind. Um, so we put, we put it all into all together into one Google Site, all Google products, and it was, um, it was actually kind of a win that we ended up going with that, but um, <laughs> but it worked out really well. So um, there's also, Jeff has put the link in the chat for that as well. And when we post these slides, those links will be there too. Um, they would have been posted already, except that we were still adjusting things up until our presentation. Uh, Tiffany, I'll just say, you know, we're about time for questions. Um, yep. Perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> so, and I'm gonna stop recording at 4.55, but you guys are welcome to hang around and chat afterwards too, so. Um, okay, um, what time is it now? 4.52. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, that's our that, that's what we have for you. Um, thank you, do, what, what kinds of questions do we have though? Well, the first one's from uh, Richard Palmer. He says, have you found the leadership teams uh, you have built to be robust within the context of COVID-19 for the needs of both the institutions and faculty? So uh, one thing I wanna definitely put out there is that all of our, um, our champions are volunteers. Um, we can't pay them for their time in this role. Uh, some of them are grantees and then we could totally cover their time that way, but they are doing this out of the goodness of their heart, pushing good stuff forward because it's the right thing to do. So I don't think you can ever get a team robust enough to manage what's happening with COVID-19. But when it comes to uh, this group of leaders, they are incredibly engaged. We've had, if you saw the first um, plenary session, uh, well, the, the part before it where they're asking you a bunch of questions on Mentimeter, we did that with our uh, our ALG champions to uh, to get some feedback on our strategy moving forward. Uh, everything from our mission and vision down to the measurable goals, which is going to be uh, happening pretty soon. And their input has been invaluable. Like we've been able to find some emergent trends in what they're saying that have brought us some insight into how we're going to move forward. So. Um, I think as a team of people working with us on uh, on that kind of support, I think it's pretty great. Uh, Tiffany, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to. I'm I'm just going to add that um, I do I do think that they've really stepped up to the plate with COVID, though. Um, as busy as they are on their campuses, they're still holding up their uh, their advocacy and their support on their campuses. Um, they're still coming to meetings and contributing to our discussions and, you know, helping us make decisions and things. I, I really feel like they, uh, it, in the context of COVID-19, they've really stepped up um, and held their own <laughs> through everything. <laughs> oh, thanks, Veronica. Thanks, Christine. 